Let's talk about race. You know, you can't see the money can't be eaten. Assassins, right? It's where you be. Once again. But I got some help for you. Check this out. Here's the escalator. World dominator. Miseducator. Boom, toon, walk to the devil's lair. This virus of racist faces contagious to all types of places. Gotta peel layers off, and it ain't gonna get done soft. Discussion can stave off the bussin', fussin', bum rushin'. Politicians filibusterin', ways to usher in eugenetic disruption. Won't terrorize those with open eyes, not dealing with fakes who just wanna sit around and theorize. Meanwhile, in the street, another pair of police state hate related victims. The mind's eyes lay lifeless Looking at concrete Many topics, many ways to drop it How did we get here? When we say how do we get here, we're talking about how the Black community has reached the point and where it is in a historical context, especially when viewing that through the lens of the effects of white supremacy and how it's affected issues of social justice and especially the modern wealth gap. So when viewing this historical context, we need to begin by discussing America's original sins. So when we do this, we're discussing the aspects of the theft of land and people and the systems that were used to continue and exacerbate those aspects, how these things were first protected and codified in law, and how even after those laws were changed, how they continued to be justified and protected through practice and social action. So to begin by discussing the history and the aspects of slavery, we have to begin with how slavery actually originated in the United States. So in order to begin that conversation, we have to understand the context of all of this. People generally have a working understanding of how the history of slavery or how at least the function of slavery in the United States uh, sort of uh, persisted through its golden age, so to speak, but it may be uh, significantly less commonly known exactly how it began in the incited incidents. So the exciting incident, what happened in uh, 1619, where a Portuguese uh, slaver vessel was uh, in need of repair and resupply off the coast of Virginia. And so it made port off the coast of Virginia. However, they, these Portuguese sailors lacked any form of currency, and they only had their trade goods which they were traveling with, which happened to be chattel slavery, African slaves. Now, at this point, there wasn't a history of African slaves being used or imported into the original 13 colonies yet. And so it was relatively unfounded to the uh, Virginian settlers at the time. But they certainly accepted the currency that was being spent here to repair the Portuguese sailor ships. And they took the 350 African slaves and as payment for the repairs and the resupply. Now, originally in this settlement and in this context, there was a much more loose and indentured servitude-esque aspect to how these slaves are going to be treated. However, very quickly, not even a generation into this, uh, to the situation, this was deemed by the colony of Virginia to no longer be a realistic or feasible option and much more strict laws separating how white indentured servants and black slaves are going to be treated were issued that were much more in line with how future aspects of African slavery in the United States would continue to be developed.
Something that's important to note is that all 13 original colonies were involved in the slave trade, generally with that same working knowledge or concept of American slavery that most Americans and even foreigners have about American slavery. It deeply revolves around the South and especially the Deep South. However, it's important to understand that all 13 original colonies were involved in the slave trade, though it's true that the South and the Deep South had a much higher population of slaves because it was more economically viable to rely on hard physical labor that slaves could perform in order to harvest crops that were more realistically drawn from a longer growing cycle in the warmer South than the colder North. There was still slave labor in regards to uh, crop harvesting on the smaller plantations in the North, as well as in other forms of labor, such as some simple aspects of uh, naval supply manufacturing. However, the economy of the North was much more reliant on things like sailing and aspects that slaves were generally not used for in the United States. However, even in these aspects of the Northeast that were less reliant on slave labor, aspects of importance in the institution of slavery was still very powerful in the Northeast. And New England cities such as Providence, Rhode Island were one of the premier locations and destinations for slave imports. So ships that were involved in the triangle trade system, which revolved around European powers, purchasing African slaves from the African continent or capturing African slaves in the African continent in some cases, bringing them to the colonies in the Americas, whether that be originally in the Caribbean islands to later on South American colonies such as Brazil. And then now at this point, North American colonies such as Mexico and now the 13 colonies and cities such as Providence, Rhode Island, as I had mentioned, were premier locations in uh, relation to these African slaves being brought to these colonies. These slaves were used in order to harvest the raw resources that could be more realistically and in larger numbers grown in the colonies before they were sent back to Europe, where they were manufactured into completed goods and then sold to both the colonies and to various African kingdoms in order to buy more slaves or in order to stimulate the economy in said colonies. And that's how it all plays into this overarching triangle trade economic system, which was the main driving force for slavery, as we know it in regards to European African interaction. An important moment in history that really uh, marks a change in American slavery and an important aspect that would continue to truly uh, distinguish itself as we talk about the uh, history of slavery in the United States was the Missouri Compromise, which was a compromise that was made in order to have the slave population of states partially count towards the population of that state. So in the United States, as I'm sure most people that will be viewing this will know, the population of a state is very important to weighing its political power on the national scale in terms of how it relates to the federal union. And in that sense, Northern states had a significant advantage because it had a much higher population of white citizens as opposed to the South, which had its population of white citizens and also an extremely large population of black slaves, which weren't counted towards population in regards to citizenry because they were not free peoples. So in order to try to bolster their political power, slave states tried to you know, push forward on this compromise where they would treat their slave populations as people for the sake of having uh, more representation in the union in regards to their voting powers and seats in Congress. There was eventually a compromise set where African slaves would be counted as three fifths as an individual to this. So three fifths of the population in these states that are African slaves would be added to the population in regards to their representation in Congress among other things.
here we have images that capture some of the aspects of slavery in the South. And it's truly, for me, especially highlights two things, which is one, it helps to remind how old the technology of the photograph is. And it also helps to remind how recent slavery is, that it was able to be captured so literally captured so directly, not a sketch, not a portrait capturing these things, but a flash of a camera and the imprint of a moment captured in time. An important aspect to note when we talk about the history of American slavery, of course, is the multiple revolts and uh, insurrections that were thrown in order to have African slaves overthrow their impressors or try to seek freedom or establish individual states. Much as there are stories of slave revolts throughout all aspects of the triangle trade, whether that be slave revolts in the Caribbean, which are famously successful, such as the Haitian Revolution, or many such revolts in colonies such as Brazil, in addition to also the United States. So an important thing to note is generally how these revolts started, whether that be an African slave that had a history or background of being educated or literate that was able to spread information and able to organize their fellows in order to plan such things, especially in cases where these individuals had a military background, such as in the 1811 German Coast Uprising, where the founders of said uprising were actually military officers from the Kingdom of Congo in Central Africa, which were able to organize the slaves even without a common language because slaves were brought from all over the continent, all across West Africa and various kingdoms, Central Africa, dipping down into the Southern parts. And so they were able to be organized by certain individuals that had enough charisma, strength of leadership, and also skill set. An important aspect and historical precedent that was set, which would lay a foundation and a bedwork or a bedrock that would be uh, significantly important for aspects after slavery and after the era of slavery in the United States was the Dred Scott case. So even though it was a court case taken to the Supreme Court during slavery in regards to an African-American slave, Dred Scott, who is suing for his freedom, it was something that would lay a strong precedent for how aspects like this would be treated in the American legal system going forward. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race.